automation CI team at Lenaro, where we, we kind of shepherd a few different projects and functions within the Lenaro organization. So uh, automation in CI, and that's just a very strange thing. Uh, so we've got the Lava team, the automation test framework platform. We've got the QA services team where we provide both testing and validation analysis services and certification for some of the 96 boards projects. Um, we have builds and baselines teams where we actually work with the individual teams to help them create software builds for the work that they're doing. Um, what else am I missing? And then there's the reference platform, which is really kind of a focused software build, some focused quality engineering, um, some focused automation in CI uh, around the concept of a reference platform. And then with the reference platform, the one other trick to this is, is it's really an end-to-end -end software solution from, you know, from the, the firmware, the kernel, uh, the middleware applications, and the end user applications uh, for our segment groups. So we'll have enterprise edition reference platform, which is kind of end-to-end -end use cases around the enterprise software ecosystem. And the same for the consumer edition, for the home edition, and all these different editions of the reference platform. So we'll get into a lot of that. This conversation's meant to be a little bit of background on what the, the reference platform is, but as we, as we discuss this and have this conversation, it'd be interesting to get your feedback as well. So that's me, Alan Bennett. Uh, also, part of this conversation will be Milos. That's pretty good. <laughs> Anybody who doesn't know Milos, let me know. I've got to say the L because I just can't not say it. Uh, and then Fatih as well. Uh, built in baselines, engineering manager. So Milos runs the QA team, Fatu runs the builds and baselines team within Lenaro. All right. Um, so in Lenaro, the reference platform again is is a it's a program, but it gets a lot of its input from our our uh, our different segment groups around Lenaro. So you're gonna see um, that the, the core team is rather small, but what we get from the other teams it actually comprises of a, of a pretty large software project. Uh, of course, special thanks to everybody who's involved both directly and indirectly in making the reference platform. Um, each one of the groups, uh, both from direction as well as some of the contributions, the improvements to the individual open source software projects, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people that make the reference platforms possible, and um, we definitely appreciate all their work, including some assistance uh, in the past and hopefully in the future from our landing teams who have you know, additional support that they provide on the, the physical boards. Uh, and then at the core, so the kind of the, the center team there is really a, a group of the individuals who are responsible for getting that, that RPB um, constructed, validated, and tested for each one of the releases on the cadence that the different enterprise, or that the different editions have. Um, I don't know if David's in these, in here. Uh, so David is kind of the, the program manager for the project. Um, he'll, he'll start the conversation and make sure that we're, we're having the conversation about what, what makes up the enterprise reference platform. Um, Amaral helps facilitate the discussion with the teams and make sure that people are working on things. Fathi on the build side, Milos on the, the test and verification of it. Mark Brown, who does have a conflict right now, um, is our kernel maintainer for the reference platform kernel. We'll talk about it in a little bit. And then myself and another member, direct contributing member would be Robert Wolf. There. Uh, from the 96 boards team and it really around the uh, technical documentation side of the project. Okay. So what is the reference software goals? So you might have heard in George's keynote uh, a lot of these and we, we, we try to maintain a similar voice. So really we wanna use the reference software as a chance to collaborate, work together, um, leverage the open source software and then build a shared platform for the developers. Um, and I, I think a key point for the reference software is we really want it to be a verification and an instance of an end-to-end -end, 
um, reference product. So it should be everything from the kernel through the distribution, middleware, and then any end user applications. And it may be a customized set of those. So it might, and we might have one addition that is focused on only one use case, and so it's only one set of packages and other additions that focus on similar end-to-end end -end applications as well. Uh, a major goal that we have, do you have a question? Yeah. So the goal is that we're testing the over, or so the question is, is the idea that we're testing software or are we testing the hardware? Um, so the goal is that we're able to test that end-to-end -end solution. Um, sometimes that means that we are testing just uh, the software and there are open hardware issues or, you know, but the ideal goal is that we've actually got a solid platform from the hardware that we can actually test that end-to-end -end use case. Um, and we're, we're somewhere in the middle right now. So, but, but the reference platform, we're really trying to build that, that software system on top of some stable hardware platform as well. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. There's a lot of gray in between um, the beginning and the end of the goals here. Uh, so, with that in, in mind, you know, we really want to be able to provide a, a known level of quality for the reference platform. Um, so we do have product level quality goals. So that's making sure that we've got good subsystem coverage, we've got good coverage of the features, good coverage of the systems that we put into a reference platform. Um, and of course, uh, the other thing we want to do is really focus on the upstream technology, so we don't want to necessarily just focus on, you know, to fork off of a lot of the upstream projects and build a single, a single distribution off of a bunch of forks. We really want to try and keep the platform moving forward as close to tip in most of the projects as we can, uh, which is also a challenge. So, any questions? So what does a reference platform look like? Uh, with this diagram, we can kind of see the overall plot diagrams that would make up what we would consider the reference platform. Um, you know, so a security solution, your firmware, on top of your firmware is your kernel, um, the distribution, middleware, and then end user applications. Um, and then we, what we really try to focus on is also taking that reference platform and a 96 board product that is, um, that kind of meets the goals of the program. So it's a, it's a near tip kernel that's, um, that's got the support necessary in order to be that end to end reference. Um, kind of any questions on, I think we'll be saying a lot of the similar things. So, uh, on the enter, Enterprise reference platform, it looks very similar as well. So you take the reference platform, you build, you build your software stack up. Um, you have 96 boards to verify. You could do the verification hardware platform for the release. And then um, kind of on the right here, you'll see the developer cloud, which is a kind of a production instance of the reference platform running running on the cloud so that people can actually use that end-to-end -end implementation. Questions or comments? Okay, um, a little more vocabulary uh, around the reference plat platform. We also have what we, which you'll hear from time to time is an RPB, which is a reference platform build. And so the build is, you know, you've got a reference platform for the enterprise market and then your RPB would be a specific um, collection of components that would then make up that build. So it might not necessarily be every application installed or that is installable, it'd be really a specific suite of applications and components that are put together for that build. Um, kind of a, I think of it almost like, a, like the silver thread that ties those components together so that you've got just what's necessary for that end-to-end -end use case. Um, 
So your security, your firmware, your kernel, your user space applications make up that, that reference platform build. Uh, of course, we also want to make this usable by the community. So we want to put with that reference platform build the necessary documentation to describe the platform build, how to reproduce it, um, how, to, how to make it really easy to use. So we focus, or our goal is to really focus on making sure that documentation is there. It's, it's easy to use and um, so that everybody can get the most value without too much of their own investigations. Uh, each one of our reference platform builds should also come with a specification that defines the software that makes up that reference platform um, so that we've got incoming requirements for building the reference platform. We've got the reference platform software itself and then we've got QA and test reports that verify that reference platform and the components within it. Uh, I think this is key in order to make sure that people that use the reference platforms actually have something to start from. Uh, when it comes to their quality and verification plan. So they can, they can see what makes up the reference platform, they can see the, the test artifacts uh, that were used to validate the most recent version of, the, of that reference platform, and then they can consume and use those within their own product development teams. Uh, of course, the test reports that come out of that. And then again, you know, a key focus is really building these reference platform builds as close to tip as possible um, to show everybody how to use the most recent software, um, software straight out of the communities, uh, how to put it together, and then how to actually do that end-to-end -end use case using the upstream components. Of course, the RPB on different reference hardware may have some binary blobs um, in the firmware for key functionality, things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Molly GPA, GPUs. Um, but of course, of course, we ideally those would be a minimal functionality, you know, maybe not minimal functionality, but a minimal part of the system. So you know, again, our goal with the 96 Forge program is to have something that's open, as open as possible, so that people can see how to do this from the bottoms up. One, uh, another piece of vocabula vocabulary is the reference platform kernel or the RPK. Um, at the high level goal, the, you know, the reference platform kernel, I think this statement probably sums what we would want the RPK to be as far as a near mainline kernel that is used by the Lenaro teams for the reference platform builds. So the key there is a near mainline kernel. And one of the big problems we have in Lenaro is just the number of different maintainers of these kernels. So having enough maintainers to build your reference platform kernel and to track the changes when it's off tree is very difficult. But with our kernel working groups, if we have a kernel that's near mainline and we can get the board support into that kernel for the boards that are that the RPB is going to be validated on. It makes it so that we can leverage our, our core engineering team and, our, and somebody like Mark Brown to maintain that kernel. Instead of having to have you know, a team of kernel developers and maintainers maintain a kernel for multiple boards. Um, that's kind of the goal around the reference platform kernel. And then just reference here, these are the different kernels that we have within Lenaro. So the RPK being a base kernel plus in-flight board support, which is board support that is heading upstream to, um, so it's, it's either being discussed on a mailing list or it's being discussed in the open um, through a patch series that Mark can then integrate into the RPK. But it's really key that that, 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 that support and those, and that system is on its way upstream, so. And then the base kernel that he would he would then maintain is really um, it's kind of demand based. So right now it's following the RC series. So this is primarily because the RPK is being derived from the leg kernel right now, which is tracking mainline with their features. Um, and so we take the board support and we follow 
the, the latest RCs uh, out of kernel.org. Um, and then when we, when we lock down a release candidate, we'll, we'll kind of freeze that kernel, do the test and verification for the enterprise edition uh, throughout the release. But we'll, we'll continue to track with the, the LEG team and the enterprise RPV. Uh, we also have the LSK. I don't know if anybody has any questions about the LSK, but it's, uh, it tracks Greg Curl Hartman's long-term support kernel. Um, and it also brings in member requested ARM features and support for the two years. Uh, we, we don't necessarily build reference platform builds with the LSK because it is that historical kernel. We really want to keep the, the, the true RPK or the true RPPs built from the near mainline kernel. Uh, of course, Lenaro does have member kernels uh, through our Lenaro landing teams where we'll have either a tip kernel upstreaming tree that they'll focus on or LSK based kernels. And then some of our segment groups um, do participate in, in maintaining their own kernels as they're doing development. Question or? Okay. Any questions around the RPK? It's a So how, the question is, how long will the RPK kernel be maintained? So right now, it's a tracking kernel. So we will, we will follow it through a release, and we'll do the verification and test of the RPK kernel at release, and then the RPK kernel will move to the next, next release so that we can leverage the maintenance from Mark Brown. Um, so it's, a, it's essentially right now based on the resources more or less an unmaintained kernel over time. Um, it's really that, that demonstration kernel. It's that how do you bring everything together and do the release and the build for a, a specific RPB release. And then what's most important is we take all of that and we move it into the, the next kernel as we move forward. And so we're continue to bring those patches to support the next release from the last release, if that makes sense. Yes, I would say right now that um, it is more of the demonstration kernel. So if somebody wanted to take that kernel into production, it would have to be maintained. Um, you'd have to have security patches come into it, all those different types of things as you were to lock down. If, if you do choose that as your strategy, to lock down on a kernel, you would want to make sure that you, that you are prepared to you know, to maintain that over time, because we, we don't have a maintenance strategy for the RPK for product development, if that makes sense. Uh, is this RPK kernel uh, for all different RP platform uh, project? You know, there are so many different uh, RP platform uh, the, uh, for IoT, for mobile, for MTS, something like that. So this this kernel is for all these <coughs> different uh, uh, RP project. So the question, you know, I'll just repeat it just in case. Yeah. Uh, to make sure I understand it as well. Um, is this is there one RPK for all of the different reference platforms? Um, so the answer is yes, sort of. Um, so for most of the projects, we do try and track an RPK that is maintained by Mark Brown as that upstream tracking RPK. Um, the differences to that statement are with, with LMG and a, you know, an AOSP based kernel, they track a different mainline uh, for the, the LMG based AOSP builds, which would be um, kind of the Lenaro confectionery release. Um, so in that one, they'll track the, I think it's the Google common kernel and so LMG provides a kernel base to use for the confectionery release, which is pretty much what we would use for the AOSP based RPB. Um, other projects, it, it kind of depends on feature support right now. 
So with the consumer edition boards, the RPK ideally would be the latest tracking RPK that Mark Brown is maintaining. A problem that we've had is the, the support of the features necessary for that RPB to be a feature rich RP, uh, or feature rich build. And so for instance, the 1609 release um, is being built with the kernel that was released in 1606 just because we did not have the patches that were supported in 1606 follow forward for the consumer boards that we built the RPB out. So the goal is yes, it is one unified kernel. Um, it is a tracking kernel that is close to tip so that we're not maintaining a fork. Um, but there are some deltas to that strategy because of either resource loads, um, support from the necessary hardware vendors, um, et cetera. If it's a common uh, kernel for all different uh, reference platform projects, uh, it, uh, if it will vary uh, tight, uh, tight uh, for the merge, uh, merge windows for all these uh, different uh, projects, you know, if, um, uh, if uh, you, you maybe you need to handle a test for all different uh, hardware so that uh, uh, and uh, merge all, all parts from different uh, uh, platform. So uh, this will maybe will, you know, it will, uh, will let the project uh, schedule to become very tight and, uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, so I want to know, uh, uh, are this if if this will impact the the uh, uh, RP, RPK schedule and right. uh, progress of the so I, I think the question is kind of around all right so now everybody's relying on one kernel base yeah, yeah. and maybe this RPB's got a bug will it you know really put at risk the rest of the releases for that release um, it could. Uh, I don't know if we necessarily have all the rules in place to deal with that situation and there's, you know, it, it's that complex yet, but it is definitely something we need to come up with a strategy for, is to make sure that the release is not necessarily held hostage by any one issue on any one of the RPBs, but that we can actually, you know, separate them but keep them together. So it is a challenge that we probably need a better strategy for when we get to a point where we have so many boards releasing at this, or so many builds releasing at the same time, relying on a same unified kernel set. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's on. It's on GitHub, I think it's GitHub slash Lenaro slash just RPK. So sorry, I didn't get that link in here. Oh yeah, the question was is uh, where is the public repository for the RPK? And so it's github.com slash Lenaro slash RPK. Any other questions? I think the RPK is probably one of the, the key areas where we really want to make sure we have a dialogue with the community. Um, just because it's a it's it's pretty important to this challenge, and a lot of the it it you know it really builds the platform that we we do our verification on as well. At least that supported feature rich support within a within a Linux kernel, or at least on the you know, on a, a Linux-based RPB. That answers about my topic. All right, so what does the, the matrix look like um, right now for RPBs? So each one of the, each one of our additions, which is really just nomenclature, it's um, where we, we derive a lot of the strategy behind each one of these from you know, a specific Lenaro segment group um, or, you know, other goals of the program. So one being a consumer edition RPB, which is 
almost built around being the firmware software support for the consumer edition reference platform builds. Uh, so we build, we currently are building four different user space variants. Uh, most of them are, are pretty similar except for the, the graphics system. So we've, you know, the open embedded, we've got a console only, an XORG based, and then a Wayland based um, system. We also have a, a Debian stretch. We've got the RPK, which is currently based off the 1606 release, um, which is the 4.4.11 there and then we we tested on two boards and there's a question around you know what is the going new strategy for doing builds and verifications on um, I don't think we do any right now but but that was it's a potential uh, on could you kind of describe uh, so the question being, why do we have a Wayland build? Um, I was wondering if you have a good reason behind the background. You can stand here. So um, the Wayland based uh, image for, uh, for OE is coming from a requirement of HT. So we are using, using that. Uh, some other people are still using XORG and uh, do some testing with Mali. So that's why we have two uh, graphical based uh, builds for OE, one based on XORG and one for Wayland. Yeah, so really the home group and some of their yeah. development use cases see that as a priority. Uh, so right now, the kind of the the bootloader strategy is to really unify around UEFI. Um, again, that you know could change, uh, but with the boards and the, the requirements we have coming in right now, it's it's really focused on UEFI at, at the bootloader level. So question around uh, what are, what's the strategy around 32-bit platforms? And I think just this release, we've started to look a little more. Yeah, so 32-bit platform are not a uh, lot. We have one coming actually from ST. So uh, upcoming RPB will, uh, will add support for 32-bit uh, uh, builds. And I think one is coming also from uh, Qualcomm. Yeah, so yeah, it's not, done yet, but uh, for upcoming release, we, we will have 32-bit support and builds and platform supported. And the, the kernel is the same binary one in both cases or just the same software? Uh, it's the same uh, source code. For both 32 and uh, 64? No, for So, <laughs> yeah, the, ma the main issue is uh, enablement. So uh, for server platforms, it's kind of easy to have a unified kernel and have one, uh, one binary. Uh, for ARM7 and 32-bit platforms, it should be okay. But there's some use case where we, we can't have uh, one si single binary uh, simply because uh, some people are stuck on the uh, user space because of Mali or some other binary slot. So can, can you repeat the, the yeah, question then? So if you already have a kernel that runs on the high TMB, uh, for example, uh, what, what's the strategy for that kernel that, that you can't use for the enterprise platform? Enablement, again. Oh. So basically, enablement. So we can use the same kernel for CE and server platform, and we can boot. The problem is that for some use cases, we need more enablement. So what we have with the single uh, kernel um, is just bare uh, booting of a system. And for example, the, if you take uh, Dragon Ball 4.10C, for example, 
in mainline kernel, not all of the features are enabled. And some might be, well, it will never happen or it will take a long time. So that, that, that's why we can't, we will have a unified kernel, we have a unified kernel, but it doesn't bring the same enablement and the same future enablement on the platform. I think that's really related as well to Justin's question around, you know, having that unified kernel and requiring that for a release, ha you know, puts everything, all the priorities, all the builds to make sure that that works on all those platforms. And so because of some of the enablements, we've had some divergence, I guess, from one su single unified. The goal is absolutely one single unified. We just, with a reality between here and the goal, we haven't, haven't been able to get all the features necessary to have a feature-rich build in a unified kernel. But, but the, the enterprise kernel will run with, with the base rules that have all the other uh, platforms to the other. Um, hopefully it's much more than a basic feature set. Yeah, so question slash statement is really, you know, if we continue to grow the program, we continue to focus on one single unified kernel, you know, do we have enough resources to, in a timely manner, verify all the features that would come in? Um, we probably don't right now. That's a big reason why the strategy is a near mainline kernel, because the, you know, the ultimate unified kernel, I think, is mainline. Um, so getting those features upstream so that they're supported, so that when we do build the unified kernel, we don't have to bring the entire technical debt of each individual with it. So uh, right now, we, I think we're staffed sufficiently to cover the platforms, but as it grows, that would be a, a pretty big concern if a, if a hard requirement was to use one single unified kernel. Um, getting all that testing done. Uh, so on the enterprise edition RPB, you know, user space builds today focus around CentOS and Debian builds. Um, we are, you know, the 1606 release went with a 4.411 and the, the target for the 1612, the estimated 1612 release, or I mean, the estimated is on 4.8 with hopefully the 4.9 LTS releasing in that near that time frame. Uh, we would do a 1612 release of the RPB and then likely a point release of an RPB when 4.9 releases so that there's one tracking that next um, RPS as well. And then the current reference systems, the D02 and 3, uh, also hoping to look at the D05 for the 1612. Uh, Qualcomm board, the Cavian Thunder X, and then the AMD overdrive. Any other coming? No, not for 16.12. Yeah. Uh, let's see, so the home edition, so with the release of the Poplar board that you guys had a chance to see yesterday, we are looking at uh, defining a build or two around the Poplar board for the home group. So those are in, in progress right now. We expect that, if not in the 16.12, to be shortly after. Um, we're also working with the home group on the cadence of those releases, you know, how frequent, and uh, the rest of the specification around the home, and then the same around the network edition as well. Uh, the network edition is looking at four separate re releases. I have them in my notes, but I don't have them uh, displayed to me, but there'll be more information about those coming out as well. Any other
other questions around what makes up the different RPGs? Uh, so there's a quick slide I added in. It's not in the download deck. It's just really to describe how the evolution of the, RP, the reference platform builds um, would occur. So if uh, this is not a lot of specifics in here, but just to let people know that you know, an enterprise edition could start and only be one specific build and it's very custom build and it's not leveraged in any other builds beyond that. But for instance, the enterprise editions reference platform is planned to be the base reference platform for our network, for majority of the network build. Um, so you, you could see a, almost a make from relationship to where we have an enterprise edition reference platform and from that we make the developer cloud image and from that we make the network edition um, and other network editions. So we, we try and use this kind of an evolution model so that we don't have to rebuild from scratch every single one of them, but we can actually actually leverage um, both at the specification level as well as the test verification and documentation level, these, these different approaches. Uh, so currently for the two, you know, released RPBs, we've got two different cadence life cycles. Uh, one being the enterprise edition where it's roughly a six month cadence. So you got about 26 working weeks um, where we'll, the goal is to have the requirements captured in the first four weeks of the cycle and we iterate both among the feature development teams as well as the platform teams and any upstream, um, I guess, feature review and in inclusion. Um, and the teams will iterate after about 20 weeks, we freeze the features and we start working on the release candidates. So it's not necessarily a code freeze, but necessary, you know, more, no new hardware boards are allowed after that date. No new, you know, major software features would would be wanted at that point because we're really trying to harden the release um, in that remaining four to six weeks. Um, and then the consumer edition is pretty similar except for it's, it's half as much time. And so the large features are ones that we would integrate and, and verify over multiple cycles just because you, know, you really only have about six weeks from um, planning to release and, and harden the cycle. So it's a, it's a pretty fast cadence. We'll be looking at that cadence to see if a, a quarterly cycle is necessary for the, the consumer platforms. Um, but right now that's, that's kind of where we're starting from. Any questions on these? I know today um, we are not necessarily on this cycle. Uh, we are you know, I think we're, what, eight weeks from 16.12 release, give or take. And so hopefully with the next one, we start those conversations a lot earlier so that we can really come up with our goals and our strategies with enough time to, you know, allow the teams to do development and planning, um, and especially for external partners as well. If anybody who's going to use this um, knows ahead of time what features are coming, um, what the major goals are. Uh, the two, uh, you, you mean uh, you will uh, give two uh, releases per, per year, is it right? Uh, for the uh, enterprise edi edition, is it right? If, if that, I think maybe it's too, too, too little for the version okay oh so it's more release uh, maybe I think uh, four uh, uh, three three uh, uh, um, uh, per, per, per three months uh, for our version is better I, I think right okay yeah um, I don't think Martin's in here is he Martin director of the LEG I think he might have been double booked um, yeah, that's, that's great feedback. I think a concern that we've had is to make sure that we're not spending so many resources multiple times a year in the hardening phases. Um, but really, these life cycles and strategies are built around each one of those segment groups. 
And so when it comes to the enterprise edition, um, I think we could support that if that was the direction that came out of LAP. Enterprise edition RPB original cycle was uh, three months. It was decided, uh, uh, you know, within LEG group uh, discussion with the members that uh, three month cycle was pretty difficult to catch up for enterprise space. Uh, so I think they came came to the conclusion that maybe we should start to push back the cycle to be twice a year, which is six months, and see how it goes. Obviously, we are you know we are always open mind to discuss the frequency ongoing. Another thing around kind of the planning around these builds is, we'll go over it in a few slides, but it's really it's establishing more of a structured community around these so that we're having the regular discussions with involved members, vendors, and users um, around that kind of on a bi-weekly cadence. So there's, there's hopefully more of that communication challenges or channels that'll be open to have these discussions and adjust, you know, have the dialogue around adjusting the, the delivery cadence. I just wanted to add that uh, what we don't see on this uh, slide is uh, it's not only uh, Big Bang release every six months. So we might have incremental updates of components uh, during the life cycle. So for example, let's say we have an OpenStack update happening. Uh, we might have an update on OpenStack. We don't have to wait the complete cycle to get the updated uh, release. Components could definitely have different cycles. Any questions around life cycle? Are you taking notes, David? Did you capture that one? No, okay. You look like you're taking notes. Uh, okay, so, you know, having Product level quality goals, I think, is important. Uh, ask Milos to really kind of summarize what those goals are. And so, you want to walk us through these? Next slide. Okay, so as I was told, we're, uh, we're aiming for a product quality. So, in order to get there, we need to define what the product actually is. So, in order to get to, to do it, first, uh, uh, we need to define the requirements for, for the product. Well, it's like, uh, I, I don't want to stick to naming, it's like requirement, user stories, or whatever you call it. It's basically, we need to gather the description of what we want to do. Uh, and then for each our, uh, reference build, there's probably the, the set of requirements will be different. So the consumer edition set of requirements will be different from the enterprise one. Uh, but uh, among those, uh, the, there, there need to be a decision or agreement which requirements are mandatory, so which may uh, a core of the, of the build. Without those requirements fulfilled, we won't release. Uh, and my idea is that the initial set of requirements should come up, come from the uh, 96 board specifications. There are, like, a, there is a software part in the specs and uh, this makes a pretty good baseline for, uh, for at least trying to define the requirement. Then I guess uh, after the initial phase, we will go through the reviews and, and decide with stakeholders what, uh, what the initial set is. Uh, so those should comp uh, like be composed of the feature requirements, performance requirements, then robustness, like uh, for the moment, there were a lot, uh, a lot of complaints about uh, stability of, of the builds that we that we produced, and uh, the ultimate goal of this exercise is to provide uh, testing and uh, and validation uh, coverage for for all the requirements. At the moment, we don't test all the features, and uh, yeah, we're, we need to get there in order to uh, to ship the product. Uh, product type uh, build. And uh, then after this happens, uh, so this is still 
this is still the work to be done. After this happens, um, uh, then uh, some, some criteria for releasing needs to be defined. The proposals, the proposals are here, so uh, all the requirements or, or the mandatory requirements should be covered with tests. Uh, then the optional requirements might be covered. It's, uh, I would recommend that, but it's not mandatory. Uh, then uh, for the testing cycle, the run rate of all the tests should be 100%, so all the tests should be run for, for a release. And uh, for, the, uh, for the mandatory requirements, for optional, it's not like they don't have to be all uh, run, but if we have them, then why not? Uh, my proposal is to have the pass rate of 90%. It's, uh, I would say, ambitious goal at the moment. Uh, but if you want to have a good quality, then uh, this, is, uh, like this is a good target. And uh, again, when completing the release candidates, the, the criteria for completing should be like uh, no blocker defect uh, to complete RC1, no critical defect to complete RC2. And uh, well, of course, we can dispute what is the bug severity based on the requirements and based on the goal of the uh, of the release. Um, and uh, I think what we sh also aim to is uh, that the performance metrics are uh, do not regress uh, in the incremental releases, so we at least uh, perform the same uh, as we did last time. Uh, hopefully, better. Now, whether we do time-based release or feature-based release is yet to be decided. Uh, I guess it, it depends on the, on the group requirements. So at the moment we do time-based releases. So whatever features are there, we just release uh, and either announce them as supported or not uh, based on the testing criteria. So that's how the plan for ensuring the quality like in a nutshell looks like. Through your test case and uh, 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 attract more. Uh, yeah, test so cases. Uh, the, the idea is to have the 100% of coverage of requirements. We don't have the full set of requirements defined yet, okay. so that uh, we don't have them covered, of course. Okay. Uh, and the set of tests we're using is open, so anyone can contribute to improve those, so there's no problem doing that. And uh, my goal is to have the 100% the coverage, so without that, it would be pretty hard to ensure the product okay, thank level you. quality. Uh, what sort of baseline would you establish for your performance goals? The, the baseline for? For performance uh, goals. Yeah, so that's still to be agreed. So I guess, I guess the baseline would be what we have now. If there are like no because it's all going to be hardware dependent, right? Sorry, it's all going to be hardware yeah, so, dependent. Yeah, so so the, the performance metrics should be per hard, per hardware pr uh, platform. So we don't want to compare between platforms, but we want to ensure that the software that we run on each platform doesn't regress. So we compare apples to apples between each release and and make sure that it doesn't regress. Yeah, I mean maybe uh, since since the vendors themselves do all this, some of this testing at least a subset of what we are doing or actually they, they probably do a superset of what we are doing so maybe you could get the initial numbers from them to serve May, the maybe if they want to share yeah well and that would be i could see that kind of a sharing you know really a linaro to that specific member so it wouldn't necessarily be yeah. an open group but we could definitely cuz we want everybody to get you know, uh, better performing products in this, and we're getting that information back to them, and vice versa. Uh, how, d how would you make the link between the requirement and the test you are running? I mean, uh, on yeah. the list. I can't follow the. Yeah, I, I can't hear the question. Uh, how uh, do you make the link be between uh, a requirement and a, a test or any other thing? Uh, Traceability. Traceability between a requirement and a test requirement. Yeah. yeah, so uh, at the moment uh, we don't have uh, much of that. We're building a dashboard that, that will allow us to track between, uh, like from, uh, from requirements down to test results, hopefully. It's sort of, uh, uh, well, we don't.
don't have a session on it, right? No, no. Yeah, we, we definitely recognize that, you know, to take this to the product level, we need to bring in a lot of those practices. Um, so have the traceability from the requirements that are agreed upon by the different groups, traceability through the feature, through the subsequent verification process used for that feature. Um, and then, you know, given that kind of a system, we can actually start crafting coverage for some of these improvements over time. So we're, we're putting that in place. So we'll see. Young one, let's go. Yeah, so some more comment rather than questions. So first comment on the performance. So uh, by default, we are n not going to compel, as Milos said quite rightly, we're not going to publish compel uh, comparison between platforms and performance oh. without specific agreement with uh, both vendors. I, I guess I guess that the general comment is we won't be publishing any numbers, any raw numbers. We might publish uh, something like uh, this platform improved from last time by 10% or something like this, but right. without raw numbers. Yes, especially between SLC to SLC is, is not in our mandate to do so. Uh, second, second comment regarding the uh, test, I mean, I, say, I guess the traceability so absolutely right. So we need to be able to establish the from the requirement to the test cases, and that might evolve as well. And it also that might vary uh, from segment to segment group. Yeah, from sec I, I guess the requirement might vary uh, from from uh, from one build to the other, and I guess even for the platform, the the, the set of requirements might be different because, for example, some ha some platforms might not have uh, some hardware en el enabled, right? Dragon Board has GPS, high key doesn't. Yeah. Okay, so the next is really what's coming, um, kind of a discussion slide here. So we are working to establish a reference platform portal, portal which will kind of be the landing page for the project. Um, provide description, provide links to the specifications, the tests, the test coverage, etc. cetera. Um, we are evaluating the new reference build use cases as they are coming in from the members, um, getting our strategies in place, working with them on those specifications. Um, evaluating new hardware boards that are coming in and, you know, really the closer you get to the, you know, an upstream supported board, the easier it would be to bring into the project. Um, and working with the 96 boards project, I, I think they, they talked about two different levels of 96 boards in both community and um, kind of reference hardware certifications. Added, adding the, oh yeah, that's the, the different classes of the reference software. You know, so the challenge we have right now is feature completeness with a near mainline kernel. Um, we end up with something that is a little harder to do a full end-to-end -end verification validation on. Uh, the concept here is to have, you know, have the ability to do some verification that's a little more complete for an end-to-end -end use case. Maybe it uses a a kernel that's a little further from TIFF. Maybe it uses um, something that provides a little more feature support, but it's not quite a TIFF board, and that would be more of a community project versus the, you know, really that reference platform project, which, it, which is trying to stay as close to TIFF as possible, but maybe, you know, but also to have the features necessary to, you know, to really be an end-to-end -end use case. I don't know if anything's written that specific, um, but I could see that it being logical. So the question around if you if you use the reference platform and then you make a change to it, and it makes a change that maybe violates one of the you know one of the core principles of being an upstream. So maybe you take your kernel and it's a a 318 based vendor kernel that works really well and provides all the features, 
can you still call that this is derived from a Renault reference platform? Um, maybe. I don't, I don't know if we have that, that language really specified. I, do you have any gang as far as the plans on the 96 boards? The main difference between uh, community, I mean, RP35 is really in terms of hardware, right? So the main difference between the first group in terms of uh, community boards and as to RT RP35 boards is really down to the software. So that's really wi what is, uh, you know, the difference between those two. For the community boards, vendor provide uh, software will be sufficient. For the RP certified hardware, you have to be able to uh, meet the requirement we are setting for the board to become reference software worthy. For example, upstream requirement, open source build loader, et cetera. That's really the key difference. Any other questions? We definitely want to keep the dialogue open. Uh, we will be establishing the portal and also some other communication channels as well. And so if you have questions you don't want to ask here, we um, hopefully have a open way to have that dialogue coming up. Um, so stay tuned. We'll make sure that that information gets out and you can always uh, contact any of us, you know, alan.bennett at lenaro.org and any other people if you have questions or concerns. So thanks for coming.